Good day, everyone. I will be discussing the different renal diseases. So these are the objectives for today's discussion. So upon completion of this lecture, you are expected to learn all of these things, with exception, of course, to the renal failure and um, nephrolithiasis. You'll actually have a separate lecture for this. I will not be including this for today's lecture. So generally, renal diseases are classified according to what particular structure in the kidney it affects. So we have glomerular diseases if basically the damage is in the glomerular apparatus or tubular if the damage is in the tubules and interstitial if the damage includes that of the renal interstitial. So we actually have a lot of uh, glomerular diseases, but I will be only focusing on the most common. So majority of these diseases are of immune origin such that the immune system okay, reacts with a certain antigen, okay, could be exogenous or endogenous antigen. And upon re this reaction, products are produced. Okay, more or less, these products include immune complex formation, different cytokines, and other toxic substances which when deposited into the kidneys, particularly in the glomerulus, are detrimental. Why detrimental? Because these substances causes damage to the glomerular, glomerular apparatus. Okay. And this damage may actually be, see, be seen, maybe due to cellular infiltration or proliferation resulting in the thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, okay? So uh, this thickening would actually mean that your glomerulus being damaged under tries to undergo repair, okay? Eventually going to, to fibrosis such that time will come that the damage has actually overcome the repair mechanism of your glomerular basement membrane. And remember I mentioned that immune being immune origin, okay, we actually have so many substances that becomes activated and plays a role. No? For example, your complement system. So your complement system, you learned in my previous lecture that the complement system actually is part of the innate immune system wherein its main goal is to actually cause lysis or removal of the um, pending or the antigen, okay? And some of these complement system forming complexes with the antigens would actually deposit okay, into the basement membrane, thus causing further damage. It's we also have non-immunologic causes of glomerular damage, maybe due to chemical exposure of toxins. Okay, so for example, toxins would include your um, hemoglobin, okay, or myoglobin. Cases where in these substances there is injury, okay, muscular injury, or there is Policies of your red cells in, 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 inside the body, when, when these substances, when these toxic substances are deposited in the kidney, these could actually cause disruption of the electrical membrane charges, okay, which may lead to nephrotic or nephritic syndrome. So I've mentioned that majority of renal diseases are brought about by immunologic mechanisms, okay? 
immunologic mechanisms. And these immunologic mechanisms may be brought about by two sub-mechanisms. So remember, your immune system generally is divided into two. So we have the innate and the innate or natural, and um, those playing a role in the acquired immune system. Now, generally, these immunologic mechanisms, okay, which predisposes to the development of renal diseases, particularly glomerular diseases, may be antibody-mediated or cell-mediated. Let me explain that. Let's start with cell-mediated. Okay? Cell-mediated would mean that it's actually the T-cells, okay? Sensitized T-cells endure the glomerulus. When we say sensitize, this would actually mean that initially or previously, these T-cells were exposed to the offending antigen. And upon second exposure, okay, being exposed, exposed ones, they become now sensitized. And upon next exposure, second exposure to that same antigen, which has caused its sensitization, cell-mediated immune okay, response would actually take into place. So this is now the time, the second exposure, wherein your T-cells would secrete substances which would cause glomerular injury. For example, when you have your different cytokines, any other toxic substances. Okay? Now, under antibody-mediated is the formation of immune complexes. Okay. Now, this antibody, when you when your is usually produced, when your immune system is, is exposed to a certain antigen. And upon exposure to that antigen, okay, there is production of antibody. These antibodies will actually form complexes with the antigen to facilitate its removal. Okay? And these immune complexes may deposit into the glomerulus, causing activation of your leukocyte and complement system, okay, depending on where that particular complex is deposited. Or could be also in autoimmune diseases, okay, your antibodies will attack your glomerular cells because in autoimmune diseases, remember, you have learned that your immune system could not distinguish host from non-host components. Okay, now several mechanisms are actually involved in this antibody-mediated immune glomerulonephritis. Would be, as I've mentioned, the antigens form complexes with the antibodies, and these antibodies now are deposited in the glomerulus. Okay, and upon deposition in the glomerulus, this attracts inflammatory cells. So the role of your inflammatory cells is to actually, their goal is to actually remove this immune complexes. However, okay, throughout this process, there is also activation of complements and this deposition of inflammatory cells and, and subsequent activation of the complement system would eventually result to glomerular injury. So as a response, your glomerular basement membrane or glomerular cells undergo thickening, eventually undergoes fibrosis and will lead to damage. Now, there are instances okay, that the immune complex forms in the glomerulus. Okay? So in the first case, what happens is that immune complexes forms in the circulation and then deposits into the glomerulus. Now, times there, times happen when, there are times when there is incito, meaning in the glomerulus itself. In the glomerulus, there is formation of immune complexes. Okay? And the same mechanism, D 
these immune complexes would actually attract leukocytes to the site and eventually activate the complement system leading to glomerular injury. I've also mentioned that antibody-mediated immune glomerulonephritis may be okay, mediated by autoantibodies, meaning these antibodies are auto. Auto means self, no? So they are these antibodies are directed to your self, okay? So your self antigens, which in normal person are actually tolerated by your immune system. Now, since maybe in some cases you have actually lost no that immune tolerance, and so your own antibodies would attack your own cells, your own antigens. This will eventually now cause deposition or it would attract inflammatory cells such as your leukocytes to the endothelial lining of the glomerular capillaries and eventually this promotes inflammation and damage okay? damage to the glomerulus and uh, this is usually seen in in people with anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic autoantibodies or antibodies they're actually a lot I'll be focusing more on this this time. As I've mentioned, glomerulonephritis is actually brought about by, it's actually a broad term, an umbrella term, which covers so many diseases. And for today's discussion, I will be focusing on the more common ones. Okay? So let's start with acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So let's break down terms. So this is actually a glomerulonephritis, okay, which happens after you had streptococcal infection. That, thus, the term post-streptococcal. Okay? So acute meaning this actually happens after a certain period of time uh, after you have um, been infected with streptococcus, particularly uh, group A streptococcus. All right. Now, symptoms usually occur in children and young adults following respiratory infections caused by certain strains of group A streptococcus that contain the M protein in the cell wall. So what exactly happens this. Okay? Let me direct your attention to the, the figure okay, on the right. So streptococcal infection may be in a form of um, in, infection affecting the, the upper respiratory tract okay? or it may be in a form affecting the skin or epitigo. Now, upon infection, remember you've learned in your microbiology lectures that particularly your streptococcus has several virulence factors. And these virulence factors would actually trigger okay, a certain immune response from the to the host, eventually leading to a cascade of events. And the main okay, the main consequence or result is the development of your glomerulonephritis. Okay. Now, particularly the exotoxin B released by your streptococcus, okay, is an antigen deposited in the glomerulus. The same goes with another antigen released by your group A streptococcus, which is what we call uh, nephritis-associated plasmin receptors. These antigens okay, being unique, group A streptococcus, during or following streptococcal infection are deposited in your glomerulus. Okay? So again, the main mechanism being the antigen being deposited in the glomerulus first 
without forming immune complexes with antibodies in the circulation is in situ. Okay? Meaning, the immune complex forms in the glomerulus, not outside the glomerulus. Now, antibodies are directed to these toxins, virulent factors produced by the streptococcal species. And this interaction with antibodies specific to these antigens would actually form immune complexes. These immune complexes now are deposited in the glomerulus. And once you have now immune complexes deposited in there, this would. Okay, remember what is the common, most common um, signal for activating substance for a complement system, specifically your, your classical pathway, formation of immune complexes. Now, um, your alternative pathway may also be activated. Remember, you learned in my lecture in, in complement that the substances in the surface of the bacteria okay, or any other virulence factors released by the bacteria during in, to cause infection could actually activate the alternative pathway. And products of complement activation will actually, okay, will actually trigger production of cytokines and chemokines and um, also causing infiltration with granulocytes and other cells in the immune system, okay? Now, causing glomerular damage, okay? And these immune complexes formed by the different antigens from Streptococcus group A and in combination with the different immune immune substances which has initially responded to the infection would actually pass through the altered glomerular basement membrane, forming humps on the other side of the glomerular capillary walls. So the hump there would actually mean deposition of immune complexes. Okay. Now, eventually, this immune response, okay, causing damage to the glomerulus would actually result to a kidney disease. Okay. So we term it, we term it for this disorder acute post streptococcal glomerulonephritis or APSG. Now, also, I mentioned that your innate immune system would actually release antibodies, okay, which will combat these products, which will get rid or remove the products produced by the streptococcus, which are detrimental okay, to, the, to the glomerulus. And one of these antibodies which are actually produced by the immune system to remove streptococcal products is your anti-streptolysin O. Because remember, uh, your streptococcus, your group A, streptococcus also is capable of producing streptolysin O. And that's why in patients with APSGN, one of the laboratory tests we use to measure the, um, although not specific, okay, because ASO titer may be positive in so many diseases, but most likely your ASO is elevated during streptococcal infection, okay? And 90% okay, of these patients, 90% of this infection would just actually resolve without progressing to glomerulonephritis or renal failure. Now, upon damage of your, of your glomerulus, remember, your glomerulus has a main function of filtration of, of blood, thus helping in the formation of urine and removal of waste products. Okay? 
now being damaged in post streptococcal glomerulonephritis there there will be impaired glomerular filtration thus leading to oliguria okay edema edema hypertension azotemia hematuria and and among others so uh, these are the manifestations of patients okay, with APSG. So take note, the most common presentation is hematuria. Okay? Hematuria and uh, proteinuria. This is also associated with edema. Okay? And on urinalysis, there is marked hematuria, proteinuria, and oliguria accompanied by different formation of cast. So on workup, workup for uh, these patients would include performing your BUN and creatinine. So remember, there is damage, okay? Damage to the glomerular apparatus. And this damage would actually lead okay to impaired removal to impaired filtration eventually leading to impaired removal of waste substances from the body thus the increase in BUN and creatinine um in urinalysis okay it would actually show nephritis or hematuria and uh, proteinuria and um, increase okay in WBC and remember in acute APSGN what likely happens is that your complement also becomes activated and so throughout the process your complement proteins becomes consumed okay because they participate in the formation of the immune complex and eventually removal of these immune complexes deposited in the glomerulus and so you would have the low levels no, or hypocomplementinemia low levels of your c3 and c4 and low levels of your ch50 the ch50 here is actually a test to screen any deficiency in your classical pathway now your c3 and c4 being the major components of your classical pathway decrease this would also give us a decrease CH50 assay. Uh, on biopsy, okay, the gold standard is actually to do renal biopsy. And you may subject this biopsy tissue into microscopy studies or fluorescent studies. Now, remember I mentioned that the the immune complexes deposited would, would actually form humps. Okay? This could actually be seen through microscopy studies. Now, under the normal okay, light microscopy, so there is diffuse glomerular enlargement and hypercellularity. Okay? And there could be formation of presence and infiltration of neutrophils and monocytes. So remember, I mentioned that the inflammation or the one of the mechanisms to get rid of these immune complexes or antigens is to actually activate the inflammation process. And activation of the immune process would actually invite so many immune cells into the site. Okay? Thus, you see infiltration of neutrophils macrophages, monocytes, plasma cells, among others. Now, under immune fluorescence, these immune complexes are actually seen as humps or bumps. Okay? Thus, the lumpy, bumpy, or coarse granular appearance. And there is also being antibody-mediated and being complement-mediated. The immunofluorescence study of the glomerular basement membrane would actually give us a positive IgG and, and uh, C3 result. 
and on electron microscopy. Okay, so sub epithelial, take note of the location, sub epithelial deposits of the glomerular base basement membrane. But you find these pumps, okay, circled in red. Now, another glomerular disease is your RPGN or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or crescentic glomerulonephritis. So this is actually more serious than BPSGN and it has a poorer prognosis and may lead to renal failure. Okay? So this is, by the name itself, no, rapid, rapid in onset and very and progressive. No? This causes progressive loss of renal function within weeks to months. And Patient usually okay, came into your clinic for presentation with a presentation of renal failure and some features of nephritic syndrome. Okay? Now, having re renal failure, your patient may also present with decreased urine output. Okay? And if not treated immediately, this okay, may lead to death being progressive. Okay? rapid and progressive in nature. Now, this is usually associated with severe glomerular injury, okay? it's the reversible stage, and necrosis, which when it happens now, necrosis of glomerular cells, this becomes now irreversible. And eventually, these causes after necrosis, this causes your glomerular basement membrane to break down and subsequently cause formation of crescents. Now, I want to direct your attention on the flow chart here, the diagram on the right. Now, this is actually a common, okay? common passive pathophysiology of patients with RPGN. Now, again, I've mentioned that the main mechanism of glomerulonephritis may be cell-mediated or maybe antibody-mediated. Now, for RPGN, what's true is that there is actually antibody-mediated response of the immune system. Now, you actually have you actually have antibodies, autoantibodies, your anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies, and your anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies, which are actually attacking your glomerulus. Now, these antibodies would actually see your glomerular components as non-self, and so it attacks it, forming immune complexes. These immune complexes would then the, um, being um, deposited in the glomerulus would cause injury to the glomerular membrane. And this injury would actually cause release okay, of act vasoactive substances. It would trigger inflammation process. Okay, thus, would increase permeability of the glomerular barrier. And this increased permeability would actually help in the migration of your immune cells, okay, to help clear out the immune complex deposited in the glomerular membrane. Eventually, this battle okay, happening in the glomerulus would lead to the activation of your podocytes, proliferation of your epithelial cells, and a break in your Bowman capsule, leading to fibrosis, no? or scarring, and uh, formation of your crescents. So we have three types of your RPGN. Okay? So the first one, as I've mentioned, is due to the formation of your anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies. Okay? So you have your own, your own antibodies, your own self, are attacking the glomerular basement membrane, autoantibodies. Okay? 
And uh, remember that these antigens are normally present in the glomerular, glomerular basement membrane. So in a normal healthy person, you don't have these autoantibodies, okay? But having anti-GBM is actually a, an autoimmune disorder. So in, in immune fluorescence, uh, you actually see linear staining or, of course, no, being antibody-mediated, you get a positive IgG and C3 staining along the glomerular basement membrane. Now take note the difference in the characteristic staining because in APSGN, you get a coarse granular or bumpy, lumpy, or humpy staining. In type 1, you get linear staining on immunofluorescence. Um, patient serum will have will be positive for anti-GBM antibodies and patient will have nephritic uh, picture. So nephritic would actually mean your patient presents with hematuria, the usual uh, proteinuria, okay, but um, nephritic, nephritic syndrome picture, okay, more or less the same presentation with your APSGN. So your um, a condition associated with type 1 RPGN is it is this what we call good pasture syndrome. Okay. So this basically happens when your anti-GBM antibodies bind to the pulmonary, alveolar, capillary basement membranes. So this time the anti-GBM antibodies attack the basement membranes in the alveolar capillary in the lungs okay, this time. And having attacked the pulmonary substances, basement membrane, this, the clinical picture, the presentation of your patient would be um, hemoptysis. No? Patient will actually present hemoptysis. So what I'm trying to point out is that formation of your anti-GBM would actually affect would involve you know, injury in the kidney and in the lungs. Okay, In the kidney, in the form of RPGN, in the lungs, in the form of good pasture syndrome. So we have type 2 RPGN or immune complex mediated crescentic glomerulonephritis. So crescent formation may be due to immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis. So your APSGN, okay, eventually when not treated may progress into RPGN or it may be also caused by systemic lupus erythematosus, IgA nephropathy, and Henson-Lent purpura. Okay. And on microscopy studies, okay, so you get to see dense immune deposits. And unlike your type 1, your type 2 RPGN do not respond well to plasmapheresis because there are no autoantibodies in this type. So what I'm, what I'm trying to point out here is that remember your type 1 is mediated by autoantibodies. Your type 2 is actually mediated by immune complex, no? And this immune co complex is actually maybe due to a secondary disorder, okay, as I've mentioned here. Now, we also have your type 3, okay, RPGN or the palsy immune ANCA associated glomerulonephritis, also known as your Wegener's granulomatosis with polyangitis, okay. So patients have autoantibodies still, no? The same with type 1. You have autoantibodies. However, this time, your autoantibodies not directed to the glomerular basement membrane, but to the antigens present in the cytoplasm of neutrophils. So thus, we call these antibodies as anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibodies being directed to the antigens in the in the 
cytoplasm of neutrophils. Okay? Now, your ANCA, your autoantibodies, when it attacks the neutrophils because they are actually directed to the antigens in the cytoplasm of neutrophils, it causes activation of neutrophils. And when neutrophils become activated now, they adhere to the endothelial cells lining the glomerular capillaries. Now, upon okay, adhesion to the endothelial cells, this would actually promote inflammation. And remember, you learned, no, I've mentioned this, that products of your inflama inflammation would actually cause damage, eventually damage to your glomerular apparatus. Okay? And this glomerular injury progresses really fast such that you get to observe loss of renal function and eventually fibrosis or scarring of your glomerular cells eventually leading to crescent formation. Okay? So, palsy immune, presentic glomerulonephritis can be idiopathic or may be associated with systemic vasculitis like your P. anca or Wegener granulomatosis or your C. anca, depending on the type. So there is no, as I have mentioned, no anti-glomerular basement antibody because the antibodies are directed to the antigens in the neutrophilic cytoplasm, unlike your type 1. So therefore, your type 1 and type 2 should be ANCA negative. So we generally diagnose this through a battery of tests, your RPGM in general. So remember, I've mentioned that in these diseases, what's likely to happen is that you have impaired glomerular filtration function such that your waste products now that are normally excreted into the urine because they are filtered by the glomerulus, by the kidneys, becomes now accumul becomes accumulated now in the blood because they are not removed. So your BUN and serum creatinine is almost always elevated to RPG. And as I've mentioned, being a nephritic syndrome, okay, you get to see always hematuria and presence of red blood cell cast. Okay? So um, some other cast may, be, may include WBC, granular waxy, and broad cast. You also have elevated uh, WBCs in your sediments. So, so on CBC, so you're actually um, having anemia. Anemia picture, so and uh, leukocytosis is also common, and serologic testing would include anti GBM antibodies in what type? Okay, type one, correct. Type one RPGN, and then your ASO antibodies, usually seen in a, usually elevated in APSGN. But remember, I mentioned that. Remember, I mentioned that your APSGN, when not treated, may actually predispose or may lead to formation of or development of RPGN. Okay? So your anti serpulosin antibody and anti-DNA antibodies. So ASO, you use anti serpulosin usually in your APSGN um, happens after a upper respiratory tract infection or if it happens after skin infection, you use anti-DNA antibodies. No, 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 sorry. Um, the anti-DNA, DNAs, okay, should be anti-DNAs antibodies, okay, for MPTIGO. Anti-DNA antibodies is for your SLE because remember, I've mentioned that your SLE being complex-mediated may actually predispose to the development of RPGN, okay? Or presence of cryoglobulins. And of course, no? seen in type 3, we have elevated titers of your ANCA in pulsing RPG. 
So again, just to make things clear, anti-DNAs okay, with SE antibodies is usually elevated after um, um, APSGN, okay, following a skin infection. But the anti-DNA antibodies here is actually used to detect antibodies no, in SLE. So your complement system is also measured because there is activation of complement system in RPGN. So these complement proteins becomes consumed. Okay? So eventually leading to hypocomplementinemia. And the gold standard is actually doing renal biopsy. Okay? So you get to see crescents, crescentic cellular mass that fills the Bowman space more than 50% of the glomeruli. So in microscopy studies, um, it would actually differ no, depending on the type. So in type 1, okay, in anti-GBM antibody disease or type 1, so there is linear or ribbon-like deposition of IgG. Okay, You also get to see linear and granular deposition of C3 being complement mediated. In type 2, or immune complex RPGN, there is diffuse, irregular, mesangial, IgG, and C3 deposits, so diffuse. No? And in type 3, these deposits are actually usually not detected. However, there are crescents. Okay? There are crescents seen, which is actually due to fibrosis or scarring of your glomerular basement membrane cells, epithelial cells. And then we have another glomerular disease okay, we call membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. So this is a chronic progressive glomerulonephritis in, in older children and adults. And uh, this is usually marked by different alterations in the cellular granularity in the cellularity of the glomerulus and peripheral capillaries, and histologically, okay, by thickening and proliferative changes in the glomerular basement membrane. So we have before, before we have three types, okay. So we have type one, which is characterized by dense deposits in the subendothelial space. Type two characterized also by dense ribbon-like deposits on the basement membrane, consisting mostly of complement. And your type 3, okay, both sub-epithelial and sub-endothelial deposits. However, okay, this classification now, a more preferred classification are the three. So we have the immunoglobulin or immune complex mediated MPGN, complement mediated MPGN, and MPGN without immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin or complement deposition. So, um, in MPGN, okay, there is an immune response with which would actually trigger okay so remember we have three three classifications no the one involving immunoglobulins the one involving complement and another type without involvement of any of these two so we have now in um in mpgn okay in mpgn involving immunoglobulin or immune complexes what's likely to happen okay, is that this immunoglobulin now would actually form immune complexes with the antigens in the um, mesangial wall of the capillaries. And so there is formation of immune complexes. This formation of immune complexes would also trigger the inflammatory process and eventually these products would activate also the complement system. Okay? And so 
uh, this would actually cause deposits okay, in the glomerular basement membrane. So the location would actually differ no, on the time. So it may be caused by infections, autoimmune diseases, and uh, monoclonal gammopathies. Now, for for um, the other type, okay? the other type where immunoglobulins are actually not involved, but complement system is involved. Okay? So it may be of C3 glomerulonephropathy or nephritis or dense deposit disease, which could okay, actually cause this due to, which is actually due to dysregulation of the complement pathways. So another um, findings is that, again, as I've mentioned, type 1 causes sub-endothelial deposits. Okay? Take note of that, the location of these dense deposits. In type 2, there is mesangial and intramembranous deposits. And in type 3, both deposits. Okay? So this is actually a, a flow chart okay? highlighting to us the common findings seen in type 1, type 2, and type 3, which would okay, eventually give us a specific electron microscopy, fluorescence, and um, some serological findings. So in type 1, okay. So being associated with um, complement or immunoglobulin, okay? so there is complement and immunoglobulin. When you, you check for fluorescence, so we consider autoimmunity or infection. But for type 2, since we are only considering complement alone, okay? so there, there might be the C3GN or glomerulonephritis nephritis or glomerulonephropathy or glomerulopathies. And um, in type 3, okay, the same goes with type 1, we may consider autoimmune infection and some monoclonal gammopathies. So gold standard for diagnosis is doing renal biopsy. And I've already shown you what's likely to be seen in biopsy of these patients, okay? So another diagnostic test is to actually do your serum complement determination. Remember, complement proteins are being activated or consumed in this entire immunologic process. And so it would give us hypocomplementinia. And as seen here, if we compare the three types, we, are, we actually have a different complement profile with emphasis on the type no, not involving immunoglobulin or complement. This will actually give us a normal complement profile. Then we also have minimal change disease. Okay? So this is very common in children 4 to 8 years old. Okay. This accounts for 80 to 90% of childhood nephrotic syndrome, but it also occurs in adults comprising of 10 to 20% adults nephrotic syndrome. So as the name implies, minimal change disease is also known as lipid nephrosis producing little cellular change in the glomerulus. Okay. So usually the cause is unknown but um, it may be due no, to rarely due to drug use or, and some hematologic diseases, particularly Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is a concept map highlighting to us the pathogenesis of minimal change disease. Okay? So let's walk through this okay, very quickly. 
term in minimal change disease, this may be a predisposing factors, may be extra glomerular, glomerular diseases, or may be secondary causes, no? maybe infection, NSAIDs, as I've mentioned, drugs, or some other cancers, no? for example, hematologic cancers such as Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, these predisposing factors would lead to T cell activation and release of cytokines. So remember, when your cells now becomes active, your T cells becomes activated, its response is to actually produce effector substances in the form of cytokines. And these cytokines are actually toxic to your podocytes. Being toxic to the podocytes, your podocyte food processes become effaced. So they become flattened now and their negatively charged membrane would become now less negative. Okay? Less negative. And so there, this now would actually cause, would result to an impaired filtration of the renal blood flow affecting now the substances, the substances which are actually normally retained during the filtration process and gain access now into the asphiltrate because there is loss of or decrease of the negativity of the membrane or the surface of your glomerular, glomerular basement. So this would eventually lead to proteins, okay? Proteins going out to the urine, thus causing proteinuria, okay? So your, your proteinuria actually have so many effects. So let's, your proteins may include the proteins that are actually um, secreted in the urine or excreted in the urine would include your proteins necessary for fibrinolysis okay in in hemostasis so we have protein c and protein s and antithrombin which has a role in lysis of blood during hemostasis now loss of these proteins in into the urine because you have defective defective filtration mechanism due to the decrease negative charge in the podocytes would lead to hypercoagulable state or thrombosis. Now, another type of proteins that you lose during minimal change disease are your antibodies or immunoglobulins. And remember, these immunoglobulins actually have a role okay, to get rid of the antigens. So this would loss of immunoglobulins would result to immunosuppression and eventually infections. And you, another type of protein that you lose because of this decreased negative charge in the podocytes now are plasminogen. Okay? So remember, your plasminogen converts plasmin. Okay. Your plasminogen is converted into plasmin in the cortical collecting, collecting duct via this um, urokinase type plasminogen activator. So this would actually lead to edema. Okay? Activation of your plasmin, plasminogen to plasmin would actually lead to edema, especially in the orbits, in the scrotum, and the labia of the patient. And uh, this excretion and excretion of protein in the urine would eventually result to hypoalbuminemia. Okay? And remember, your albumin actually is the main component of your plasma. It's the main protein which actually maintains a normal oncotic pressure in the capillaries. So if you lose now your albumin into the urine because there is decreased negativity, negatively charged, the basement membrane because of damage to the podocytes, this would actually lead us now to decrease in oncotic pressure. And decreased oncotic pressure would result to 
fluid accumulation in the interstitial spaces. Thus, the edema seen in minimal change disease. Okay? And um, this fluid or accumulation in the interstitial spaces would lead to decreased volume in the intravascular space. And so decreased blood volume would lead to hypotension. Okay. And um, other findings associated with minimal change disease being a nephrotic, okay, nephrotic part of a nephrotic syndrome. There is also hyperlipidemia and um, lipiduria. So again, in summary, these are the mechanisms general seen in your minimal change disease. So again, the predisposing factors could be secondary infection or could be unknown would actually cause damage to your podocytes. And when your podocytes now become damaged, there it loses its negativity or negatively charged. No? So the glomerulus now becomes less negative. And remember, this negativity of the charge in Podocytes in the glomerular basement membrane would actually help in the filtration process such that it repels now protein substances like other negatively charged substances so as it would not appear in the urine. But since in minimal change disease, there is damage now or decrease in the cell negativity, this would actually change, no? the selectivity of the barrier. So it causes now um, filtration of these negatively charged proteins. Okay? So there is endothelial damage. Okay? Endothelial damage because of the initial damage to your podocyte. So workup would include urinalysis. So I've mentioned that there is loss of proteins in the urine. So you get to see proteinuria and um, other tests. Okay. There is also, remember I mentioned there is increased lipids in minimal change disease. And so if you stain it okay, with a fat stain, you get to see oval fat bodies and fatty cast. And during urine collection for determination of protein creatinine ratio, you get to see a level of more than 200 milligrams per millimole. And metabolic panel would, would show us a low total protein and low albumin. Okay, I mentioned that. You're losing proteins into the urine because there is Increased filtration of these substances due to damage in the um, podocytes. Okay? Your CBC would show thrombocytosis and hemoconcentration and your cholesterol and triglyceride levels are actually increased as a result of low on COVID pressures. So microscopy studies, okay? would uh, give us these results. So your glomerulus would look normal, okay? And the cytoplasm of the proximal convoluted tubular cells are laden with protein droplets and lipids. Because remember, these now, okay, become excreted out okay, into the urine. There is increased filtration of these substances. And however, there is no tubular atrophy or interstitial fibrosis. So there is no complement involved, no immunoglobulins because, as I've mentioned, this is T-cell mediated. Okay? And on electron microscopy, you get to see effacement of your podocytes. So another... Glomerular disease is your FSGS or your focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. 
FSGS is characterized by sclerosis of some glomeruli, so focal, or it may involve only a part of each affected glomerulus, we term it segmental. So this is the most common nephrotic syndrome occurring in Hispanics and African Americans, and it may occur also in older children and adults. And a primary cause, okay, are actually the following. So it may be idiopathic, unknown, no? unknown cause, because we term it as primary, or secondary because of the following conditions. So we have HIV, heroin abuse, and mutations in cytoskeletal proteins and podiosine. So microscopy studies would show us focal and segmental sclerosis and presence of hyaline okay, in the glomerulus. There is sometimes okay, deposition of antibodies, IgM and C3, but usually this is uh, negative. Okay? And there is also effacement of podocytes um, shown as epithelial denudation in electron microscopy. So this is a table lifted from Robin's basic pathology that would actually summarize all of those glomerular diseases that I have mentioned. So you have to read on this. And these are a summary. This are tests, no lab tests, which are actually significant in the diagnosis of these different glomerular disorders. So I have mentioned these already, no, in, in the previous slides. So the same goes with this, and um, a summary of information no, for examination purposes. The highlights, the buzzwords for the different disorders that we just discussed. So now we proceed to the different tubular disorders, okay? So the damage that is occurring is actually in the tubules, no? not anymore in the glomerulus. So um, one of these tubular disorder, basically the most common intrinsic cause of acute kidney injury is your what we call acute tubular necrosis, okay? Acute tubular injury or acute tubular necrosis. So it may be of ischemic type or it may be toxic type depending on its cause, okay? Depending on the cause. So under ischemic type, ischemia, meaning there is decreased blood circulation. Probably because okay, of, of some reasons, ischemia decreased blood circulation into the tubules. Okay. So there is decreased blood volume maybe due to shock. Okay. Or there may be involvement of renal blood vessels as seen in microscopic polyangitis, your hemolytic uremic syndrome, and your TTP. And in toxic, okay, this would actually involve substances which are not tolerated by your tubules, no, renal tubules. So endogenous substances, as I've mentioned, your myoglobin or hemoglobin, these are toxic to your tubules and may cause acute tubular necrosis or injury. And substances, exogenous substances such as drugs, dyes, and organic solids. So in general, this ischemia or toxin would lead to injury in the epithelial okay? tubules. Or um, if not, okay? if not causing much injury, it may be sublethal. And injury of your epithelial tub tubules, the tubular epithelial cells, would actually cause, okay? release of your cytokines and molecules which would actually invite your inflammatory cells to the tubules. Okay? Thus, 
recruitment of inflammatory cells. Now, this tubular epithelial injury may be reversible or irreversible. It is reversible now when, okay, this is what happens. So remember, you have injury of the epithelial cells, no? tubular epithelial cells. And this injury in the tubular epithelial cells would actually lead to redistribution of membrane proteins. And this redistribution now causes a loss of polarity of cells. And so eventually, okay, causing abnormal ion transport because remember, the main function of these tubules, no, tubular cells, or channels or transport proteins are actually to um, reabsorb or secrete ions. Okay? And um, this abnormality in ion transport because of redistribution of membrane proteins would eventually lead to increased sodium levels in the distal tubules. And if you can, if you can still recall in your first lessons, your increased sodium would actually cause activation of your RAAS, renin angiotensin system. And activation of your RAAS would cause vasoconstriction. Okay? And if you have vasoconstriction now, meaning the lumen of your blood vessel is actually decreased, and so this would decrease now the amount of blood, the volume of blood, that would flow into the kidneys. So eventually, leading decreased blood flow, renal blood flow would eventually lead to lesser amount of fluid or blood that is filtered in the kidney, leading to a decreased GFR. Now, a decreased GFR would eventually lead to decreased urine output or oliguria. Now, it may be also, okay, Reversible tubular epithelial injury may be also caused by detachment of cells. Now, these cells will, will actually lump up, okay? will accumulate in the lumen of the tubules, causing now obstruction. This obstruction would increase intratubular pressure because something is obstructing, obstructing in the pathway of the fluid. Okay? So it it creates increased pressure and this obstruction would create also reduced amount of fluid that is flowing all throughout the tubules because it is accumulated in the proximal portion. So eventually leading to reduced GFR, reduced GFR meaning reduced fluid that is filtrate, filtrated leading to decreased urine output. Now, irreversible tubular epithelial injury happens when there, when there is associated death, okay? death of tubular epithelial cells. This death of tubular epithelial cells would, act, would cause the cells to accumulate in the lumen or lump up causing tubular obstruction or um, eventually okay, causing decreased tubular flow, eventually leading to reduced GFR and oliguria. Okay? So the main mechanisms um, leading to the manifestations of your tubular, your tubular necrosis are this. So we have vasoconstriction, this one, the back leak of glomerular filtrate because there is there are death of cells causing tubular obstruction eventually leading to reduced GFR and decreased urine. Now we have phases of ATN, okay, ATN. So some books would mention four, okay? Some would mention three. So I will be mentioning the four phases here. But in the diagram, no, it's only showing three, okay? So we have the initiation phase, which is characterized by acute decrease in GFR, okay? So a decrease in glomerular filtration rate, meaning waste products are actually not effectively removed. And so you get to see 
an acute increase, a sudden increase in your serum creatinine and PUN concentration. Okay? In the first phase, the initiation phase. Now, the second phase, which is not seen in this table here, is what we call the extension phase. Okay? The extension phase is actually an extension of the initiation phase. So there is ongoing hypoxia okay, or ischemic event because of the vasoconstriction, remember? And there is also ongoing inflammatory processes. Now, in the maintenance phase, okay, there is a ongoing now cellular repair. However, with this, there is also ongoing cell death or apoptosis and to maintain okay, cellular and tubular integrity, there are proliferation of your tubular epithelial cells. Okay? So you get to see this laboratory picture in your maintenance phase. Again, consistently, you know, oliguria and um, more and more cells now be becomes apoptotic and so there is more cell death no so meaning there is more decrease okay urine output and so there is increased levels increasing levels of pun or creatinine however um as your body as your, the tubules could adjust no? because it's also proliferating so the the cellular function improves slowly okay as it repairs and reorganizes the integrity, the tubular integrity. So in recovery phase, okay, so this is a continuation of the maintenance phase, which in which there is continued cellular differentiation, so meaning there is continued cell repair and reorganization of the tubular integrity. And so you have now increasing urine output, okay, although um increasing amounts of sodium and potassium are lost and you are also susceptible to infection. So histologically, okay, appearance may differ depending on the, um, the stage of the disease. Okay? In early stages, so you get to see swelling of the cells with Focal tubular epithelial necrosis. Okay? There is also dilated proximal tubules with loss or thinning of brush border or granular hyaline and pigmented, um, in pigmented cases. So in later stages, there is flattened epithelium with larger nuclei with prominent nucleoli. So in nephrotoxic acute tubular necrosis, so these are the specific findings you get to see, you know, depending on the substance which has caused the injury to the renal tubular epithelium. So for example, in ethylene glycol, you get to see calcium oxalate crystals. Hemoglobin or myoglobin, these are in endogenous okay, toxic substances. You get to see red-brown cast. In carbon tetrachloride, there is lipid accumulation. In indenavir, okay, there is crystal formation with mononuclear reaction. In lead poisoning, there are dark inclusions and necrosis, large acidophilic inclusions in mercury, and among others. So we also have hereditary and meta metabolic tubular disorders. No? So I'll be mentioning three. So we have Fanconi, nephrogenic diabetes, insipidus, and renal glycosuria. So let's start with Fan Fanconi. So this is the most frequently associated tubular dysfunction. And this syndrome is characterized by a generalized failure of tubular reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubules. So it may be inherited in association with stenosis, heart drops disease, or acquired through exposure to toxic agents. Okay. So, a common um, finding, UA finding in Fanconi syndrome is that um, there is glycosuria and mild proteinuria in 
urinalysis results. Okay. So we have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Okay, could be central or central when there is um central or neurogenic when there is decreased production of your ADH, no failure of the hypothalamus to produce ADH, or could be nephrogenic. When you have normal levels of your ADH, but the receptors in the renal tubules are not sensitive to the effects of your ADH. So thus, the defect now here is in the receptors. So what's likely to happen in nephrogenic, in, in general, no diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic, remember, you have receptors that are defective. These receptors now, are not sensitive to the effect of the of your ADH. And so what's what's going to happen is that remember the action of your ADH, it's an antidiuretic hormone, meaning it actually causes no fluid to be retained. It's, um fluid to be retained and not be excreted as urine output. So what's likely to happen in um, in uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is that since the action of your ADH is impaired now, there is continuous, no, there is no water reabsorption happening in the tubules. And so this would okay, eventually lead to increase urine output or polyuria and increase water content of the urine would eventually lead to dilution, dilutional effects. So you have low specific gravity and um, a pale yellow appearing urine. Okay? So this is a sex-linked recessive gene and um, this may be caused by medications or a complication of polycystic kidney disease and sickle cell. So you will have a um, separate discussion no, on nephrogenic diabetes insipidus in your endocrinology classes. Then we have renal glycosuria. Okay? So in renal glycosuria, um, what's likely to happen is that there is defective reabsorption of glucose. Okay? Re um, Defective reabsorption of glucose because the tubular reabsorption capacity has reached its threshold, okay, or Tmax, which is 160 to 180 milligrams per dl. And anything excess of this 160 to 180 is actually discarded or excreted out in the urine, okay, appearing as glycosuria or glucosuria. So this is a table summarizing the um, um, buzzwords, okay? The picture, clinical picture of the different inherited metabolic and tubular disorders. As I've mentioned, your ATN may be due to ischemic or toxic substances. Fanconi syndrome may be associated with other inherited substances such as stenosis or heart naps or Acquired through toxic agents, your nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is a defect no, to tubular response to ADH and glycosuria. You actually have impaired, no, impaired reabsorption of your glucose. And these are the laboratory tests, which are labor findings, no, common laboratory findings in this metabolic and tubular disorders that I mentioned. So let's proceed now to the different interstitial disorders briefly, okay? Because you will have a separate lecture on this in some of your subjects. So we have now cystitis, which is an infection in the bladder, okay? So pyelonephritis now is an infection in the kidney. Now, Clinically, how do you differentiate patients with cystitis versus 
a patient with pyelonephritis. So usually patient would come in because of urinary frequency, both no, in both cystitis and pyelonephritis. Patient would come in because of urinary frequency, urgency, okay, and even hematuria. But a clinical manifestation that would differentiate the two is the presence of fever in pyelonephritis and absence in absence of fever in cystitis. So if these urinary symptoms are associated with fever, okay, you think of pyelonephritis, meaning the kidneys are involved. But if these urinary manifestations are actually not presenting with fever, you think of cystitis. Okay? So the, the infection is in the lower genital urinary tract, particularly the bladder. Okay? Now, um, a common, okay, a common cause of these infections is usually ascending bacterial infection, okay, ascending bacterial infection, and these are commonly treated with antibiotics. Now, acute interstitial nephritis is actually allergic inflammation of the renal interstitial in response to certain medications. So, usually, if you perform um, a test here, no, that would actually confirm its present, confirm the diagnosis of acute interstitial nephritis is the presence of increased levels of eosinophils in the urine. Okay? So these are the common um, lab findings, particularly urinalysis findings, which are helpful in the diagnosis of these disorders. So remember, I've mentioned that cystitis and pyelonephritis are actually mainly caused by ascending bacterial infections. Thus, the leukocyturia or pyuria. Okay? And um, also the bacteriuria. Now, I've mentioned also that um, this may also present with um, blood, no? Amount of blood in the urine, which is usually seen microscopically, thus the hematuria, and a change in the epithelial cell membrane of the kidney, and um, in um, change in permeability of the epithelial cell membrane of the kidney and in the bladder. So you get to see here proteinuria. And um, some other tests used to confirm no, the gold standard is actually your urine culture, which would isolate the bacteria that has caused the infection. Okay? And for acute interstitial nephritis, I've mentioned no, presence of eosinophils in the urine sample. So that ends my lecture for renal diseases. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If you have questions, do not hesitate to email or contact. Thank you very much.